Okay, you guys, 35 minutes later, <laughs> I finally got this going. Apologize, at least at least we got it. JW was super patient and we just got back to the original link and tried it out. So I don't know if everyone will still come live, but at least we'll have the, we'll get it going. We'll get you the info and we'll get you the recording later. Uh, so JW, would you mind just sharing a bit about your experience uh, in the mold world and, and what we're going to kind of cover today? Sure. Yeah. I mean, professionally, I've been doing this since I was 13 years old in the laboratory. So my dad and uncle owned a laboratory and I was fortunate enough to start working there to, to pay off my first car. And um, in the 90s, we started doing a lot of mold sampling, just kind of traditional means of using uh, like a open face cassette and then eventually slick impact uh, or spore trap cassettes. And, you know, one thing led to another. We eventually got into the do-it-yourself mold testing market. So I, I have a inspection service where we perform local mold inspections, but we also, of course, have the do-it-yourself test kit that we ship worldwide for people to, uh, you know, assess their own environments. Um, I like to say 50% of what we do is on the testing. The other 50% is on the consultation. So with the test kits, you get a, a free consultation to try and help you interpret your mold re report and then have a, some action steps to try and help you improve your environment if necessary. So that's kind of what we do. Okay, perfect. And I think I had forgotten you also do local mold inspection. So that's mm -hmm. fantastic for where I wanted to start with this conversation, which is I've probably been on like 50 podcasts now and, and I've been doing some groups and so people are always like, what's the best test for your home? And after so much practice, I'm getting better at my answer, which is like, it's not that simple. Your house is a large environment. It's a complex environment. I don't know if you own or you rent or da, da, da. Uh, are you in a condo? Um, you know, it, I guess the shortest answer is like, you really need an expert to do it, to do a thorough job. My impression from the industry is not everyone is doing a thorough job of it. So maybe can you explain, let's say in the scenario, you are a homeowner and mm -hmm. you hire a local inspector like you, what should they be doing is, is one question I get. Sure. Well, you know, I think part of the realization, though, is to just like in the medical world, you kind of have to be your own health advocate. It's kind of the same on the environmental side. You know, your house is a very complex system with your HVAC system, maybe a subfloor, uh, crawl space, attics, you know, a lot of hidden wall space, ceiling space that could be contaminated. So if you're going to hire an inspector, the inspector who comes in should know what he's doing in relation to moisture, finding any potential sources of uncontrolled moisture, whether it's been a pipe leak, a flood, high humidity, um, overflowing toilets or wash machines, you know, carpeting in the bathroom, all these real common things that they look for. Um, they should have some form of infrared camera or protometer to measure mo uh, the moisture in drywall or concrete or whatever it may be. And they should be willing to collect samples. So, you know, a lot of inspectors will try and sell people by saying, hey, we don't collect any samples. We come in and just do a visual inspection which sounds great, except that only about 10% of, of mold problems are visible. The mm. majority, 90% is, is hidden in these wall spaces, crawl spaces, attics, ceiling space, places like that, HVAC system. And so you really need someone that's willing to put their eyes on it, somebody that's willing to kind of take a history of the building, just interviewing whoever's there saying, where do you feel bad? Do you know any notice any musty odors? Uh, is there anything that you know as far as history of water damage? some type of leak? Is there anything that's been painted over? You know, this information really helps develop a sampling plan. And then you collect the samples, interpret the data, match it up with what you saw vi visibly, and should have kind of a solid idea of the total biologic condition of the building, the home. And from that then, maybe additional testing is necessary, but usually you should be able to, to form some type of action plan based on that, that inspection and sampling results. Okay, so when you say sampling, what type of sampling do you do? Well, so that's the trick. So every sampling technique provides information, and they're all tools, just like a hammer or a screwdriver. You know, they, they all provide something. Do we have our favorite form of, of tools, our favorite form of sampling? Yes. We don't typically do the qPCR or the ERMI analyses uh, for various reasons, but I'm not against it, right? So it'd be like me being against a hammer. It's just, it's not our preferred method of testing because it's kind of expensive for the amount of data you get. See, when you look at a home, you, you have to think about a home as being, each room is kind of a separate environment. 
And so there can be contamination in one room and not in other rooms. So you have to have a sampling plan that kind of addresses the entire building, not just one room. So if you're looking at that, you're gonna have at least three samples in the house. Um, you know, if someone like AIHA may say it's even six samples or more per uh, kind of like a conditional zone. So you've got to have multiple samples to have some type of confidence. And if you do that with like an ERMI testing, say you do six samples of ERMI, that's almost $2,000 just in sampling costs. So that's where we kind of come forward with the, the mold check plates is that it's just an auger plate. If mold gets on there and grows, you can detect it. So our clients can see it themselves and just visually tell if there's a problem or they can send it into the laboratory where we actually quantify it and then identify the genus of mold. So those plates we use to sample the air. We also use them as tap tests in, in our hands to tap items, whether it's like couches that you wanna see if they're contaminated or pets. We used to call it a slap test, but nobody wanted to slap their pets. So we went with tap tests. <laughs> so the idea being they're, they're real versatile. And then of course we use swabs as well to look at any potential visible contamination. If you see something that might be mold growth to sample that, we can tell you what it is, what types, and you know if it's potentially a problem and then correlate that to the air testing. You can also swab dust to see if the dust is actually higher in mold than, than is typical. So like an HVAC register or something like that. Okay. So the majority okay. of what we do is between the, the actual mold check plates and the swabs. That's kind of our, our core system. Okay, so, perfect. So yeah, let's say it's like a some basement rec room. I don't mm -hmm. know if those are still popular, but they were when I was a kid. So maybe you, you you suspect some things, you see some things. So you're maybe tapping the couch, you're like getting some dust, you're doing the air. Or maybe it's like I know in my house they, they swapped the drywall or I'm sorry, like the baseboard because there was mm -hmm. some signs there. Um, that's so helpful. I just think people aren't getting like the array. Uh, of options. And, and I think it's a, a bit, I'll make a comparison. Like you said, you know, it, it's, it's complex. It's same with like the body, right? Like you say, like, I'm tired. What's the best test to test that? Mm -hmm. There's no one test. you got to run like 10 tests to see why you're tired. And then there's other considerations like your budget. And then mm -hmm. there's thinking about, okay, like, why, when did you start getting tired? Like, what were you exposed to? What age are you at? Like, what are your hormones doing? So there's sort of that, what, what I would say your, your equivalent of inspecting the environment, asking questions about the history of the building mm -hmm. is what we do in the health world um, and why there's not any one test that can tell you why you're tired is the same for the home. Um, so yeah, I think that was, that was super helpful. So you're doing your plate test. Is a plate like a just like a moist, sticky thing so that mold can get trapped on it and grow? Is that the idea? Well, it's just an auger. I mean, this is the same thing they've been doing since the 1800s to culture various bacteria or molds. And so ours is Sabra dextrose auger when it's 95% water and then it's got the nutrients in there that are very specific for mold growth. Okay. So if a, a viable mold spore lands on it and starts to grow, then it's, it's you know, obviously detected and then we can actually quantify it and then identify it. Okay. So you, you do test people's homes that they own and you're using these plates, which is good to know. So it could be a, a place for people to start. And when I've interviewed you before, it means you can put it in multiple places, tap your dog, take it to work, do all different, not all the same one, all different ones. And that lets you see more areas, which is fantastic. Um, so, so people could do that renting too as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea being, you know, we didn't want to be a bourgeois organization that only catered to the, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, right? So if you look to hire an inspector, which we, we're glad to come out and do, you're looking at a cost maybe a thousand to six thousand dollars, you know, depending on who you hire. Um, with something like the mold test plates, you're looking at something like fifty dollars to five hundred dollars if you do absolutely everything. So there's an order of magnitude difference in cost, which is important because not everybody can afford to do this. So we want to have a solution yeah. for everybody where at least they can get some actionable information. So if you live in an apartment, maybe you're going to buy three plates and you're not going to pay for lab analysis. You're going to pay $9 for plates, pay for the shipping yeah. and look at them visibly just to get an idea if maybe this is something that could be affecting your health. So, you know, there's a lot of options. We're just here for everybody in every scenario. Yeah. So what he's explaining, and I have a plate here, but it's under a pile of papers. <laughs> um you don't have, they will analyze it for you, but what you can do is buy the plate and it's only $3, 
put them all over. And if only like one or two comes up with a lot of species, then you can pay extra to send it in. Mm -hmm. And do you always talk to people or they just get a report? Always. If they send in for analysis, then they get a consultation if they want. It. I'd say less than a quarter of our clients actually take advantage of that, which is a real mistake. It's a, a tremendous value. Yeah, we do the same with our lab testing. Everyone comes with a consultation. So, I mean, it's not much to look at. It just looks like this. Um, <laughs> I bought mine originally because I wanted the poster. I don't know if that offer is still up or not, but it came with this like awesome mold poster. If you're a nerd about molds uh, like me and JW, it's yep. like, look at this. I haven't hung it up yet, but... It's this awesome poster from their company explaining it all. So if you're a practitioner, um, you can get it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it's still a offer anymore, but it was yeah, during, it the, during the... Yeah, it is? Yeah. Oh, good. What's the, yep. We'll have to look up the code again. Maybe yeah, and I don't remember the code either. I'd give it to you right now. But if, if, if nothing else, you can contact your office and we can get you one. Yeah, it was like you if you buy something, you get like 10% off in a poster or something like that. So at the time, I'll just share this little story and then I'll I'll move on to the Ermi. Um, I, during the summit, we had a, a, gar a garbage disposal fail. So I got it handled pretty quickly. And we live in Arizona. But, you know, the board underneath is like, bumpy and I thought oh well I'll get a plate to stick under there and then um, my 13 year old son was starting to take a shower when I went to the gym when I came back I pulled it in the garage and water was dripping <laughs> in my car I think he oh, basically no. run it like the whole time I was furious and um you know here's another I could I only got one so I'm gonna have to get some more so I can put these Again, I'm in Arizona. I don't think it was like the worst, but it wasn't a good situation. So it's something you could put you can put in my garage to see, you know, did anything, is anything growing in there? Um, again, I'm pretty lucky in my climate. Uh, not to say that it's perfect because you live in New Mexico, which people think of as dry as well, but you have clients there, right? So can you oh, tell tons. us a bit you know, about flat that? roofs? And swamp coolers, those two things alone keep us in business. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, well, let's get back to the Army, and then I want to see some uh, pictures and stuff. So, the Army test, I think a, I, a lot of people, practitioners in my space, still seem to think it's the the test you'd get. I just was interviewed today, and I was like, mm. No, <laughs> basically, you know, I know our friend, I think, you know, Brian Carr, they have seen so many Ermies, they're able to interpret it. They have a service for that called Ermie Code. But I've looked at ha a handful of them from my own clients. And I'm just like, these aren't toxic strains. I mean, maybe it's overall load. Like you said, if you want to run one, how do you run it in multiple places? Mm -hmm. um, can, and you're professional and you don't use them. So mm -hmm. can you talk more about that? Sure. Well, you know, the, a few things there. One is, you know, since it's a DNA based analysis, everybody just thinks, oh, that's state of the art. It's the best of the best. The problem is if you actually unpack the black box of ERMI, what's done is you, you submit a dust sample, whether it's collected on a Swiffer, a swab or a vacuum sample, you're collecting dust. This dust is then taken by the laboratory and it's sieved out. So the real fine dust is all that's left. And they take five milligrams of that for analysis. To give you an idea, a pinch of salt is about 350 milligrams. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of dust that's actually analyzed for the DNA. So if you had, say, 40 pounds of dust in your house, they're going to take like one ten thousandth of that for the analysis. And, and so it's not necessarily representative of what's in the house. Additionally, what Irby does is it reports the sample on um, a and, and five milligram basis. So it's not showing you what's totally in the house, right? So if you had one pound of dust and you had 100 pounds of dust, well, 100 pounds of dust would be a bigger potential exposure. There's just more there. So there's this kind of disconnect between what's present and then what's being exposed, what you're being exposed to. Um, but at the same time, if you get an ERMI result and it's high for stachybotrys and catomium, you've got a problem, right? So that's why right. I say it's a tool. It still does provide good information. It's just often prone to both false positives and false negatives. And it's very expensive. If you're going to do five or six samples in the house, like I said, you're looking at $1,500 to $2,000 just in sampling cost. And to me, that's just cost prohibitive. 
Well, I'm going to ask you a question that I've gotten. I don't know if you can really answer it, but I'll just throw it at you since you're more experienced than me, which I did. I think it was literally in this group. Someone was like, what's the most accurate home test? Yeah. Well, so, so what do you mean by accurate, right? So what's the purpose? Right. So in our world, what we're looking for is we're not trying to get a statistical view of a home. What we're trying to do is find amplified mold growth that could be affecting health and then fix it right? So just yeah. like when you go to, to, to your swimming pool and you want to see if the chlorine is high enough, you get a litmus paper and you put it in there and you say, okay, it's in range. Good. Let's go swimming, right? It's kind of the same idea for us in homes. We're not worried about, is it, you know, 123 spores per cubic meter? What we're worried about is it at a level that is amplified and could affect health, right? So this idea of the most accurate to me isn't quite the right question. Right. The right question is, What's the cheapest way to get quality data that I can improve my health? That's how mm -hmm. I look at it. And so like the yeah. tap test, people, is, well, you know, how many times do you tap? If you tap it, you know, 10 times versus five times, you're going to have more mold. Yes. But if you tap it five times, you wash your dog, you tap it five times, you get a comparison to see if you made an improvement. You know, same thing with your sofa. Hey, that's my sofa from college. I've been carrying around for 30 years. You tap test it. It grows a bunch of nasty stuff. You clean it. It doesn't grow any nasty stuff. We can see that you've improved your environment by, by cleaning that. So that's why we look at more of a qualitative, like, hey, what is it? How do I make it better? Not not exactly the number of spores per whatever. So that's that's our view of it. Does that, does that help out? That yeah, it does. I mean, yeah, the, I kind of answered the same, that I just don't think there's one best test. And it is just such a, a usually a big environment. And really something I've learned from the remediators and uh, inspectors I've been interviewing is like, we can get hung up about the strain and the type of test. But like, ultimately, we want to know, is there water damage that needs to be repaired and, you know, then maybe potentially like what other areas need to be cleaned or remediated, like the HVAC. But yeah, it's sort of like we get caught in like the symptoms rather than the source, mm. um, which is ultimately like what needs to be removed and handled. Sure. So perfect. Uh, well, you should be able to screen, screen share <laughs> since I'm such an expert at this. Um, if you can't, let me know and I'll try to change in some settings let me see here i'm just gonna i'm gonna do this and see if we can share this process oh i have a button that says share on the bottom do you have yeah and I, I i do too i click that and then it had me upload this file so it's processing and i'll see how it does. okay perfect it'll pull it up there it is okay so it's there okay let me see i'm gonna go to that there we go look i'm learning how to do things it's yeah helpful. awesome okay that looks pretty good on my end Does that look good to you yeah, it's a little small if you want to explain it, it. Let me see if it's, can I zoom in at all? I don't think I can. Okay, so this is basically, this is an example report I put together to kind of illustrate some points on how we look at things and why the consultation is so valuable. So in this case, general client information is at the top. We have the specialist listed here. So this is, hey, I did these samples and Immunolytics is going to call me and walk me through my results. And then this is a summary of the various rooms that were sampled and the total colony count per room. So you can see what was done, when it was done, and so on. The more interesting is on the following pages. So here's an actual report, okay? And each one of these is a sample. If we look at the living room, our scale of zero to five, is our zero to four is a healthy range. Five to nine, illness is possible. Or five to eight, nine and above illness is, is likely. So if we look at this, four alternaria falls within the scale of not really a big problem, right? Except that they're all alternaria, and alternaria is by far the most antigenistic mold species or in genus in this case. So we look at this and we're saying, well, yeah, it's not that much, but it's all alternaria. So that's interesting. We'll, we'll put that in the back of our minds and continue looking at the report. So we get to the master bedroom and here we see only one aspergillus and 12 candida. Well, of course, candida is yeast and it's not measured by any other test. It's not, it's not an ERMI, it's not on spore traps, it's not even on swab samples or bulk samples. Only the culture bowl are currently analyzing for candida. What this shows is it, the yeast most often comes from people or pets, more so than water damage in a building. So what this is indicating oh. is potentially somebody that has a yeast infection, whether it's a pet or a person. And most likely, as we see in this report, it's going to be somebody who lives in the master bedroom because that's where the highest colony counts are. Why is that important? 
Well, if somebody goes to be treated for a yeast infection, you know, the medical side, you may adjust the diet, you may do some antifungals, you know, you know, things like that. But if you don't clean the environment, they're going to be re-exposed. So you have to clean the person and the environment at the same time. It's the same thing like if a hospital gets a staph infection, they've got to clean the staph infection out of the environment so that additional people don't get infected. So here we have Candida in the master bedroom. We look at the master bathroom, which is usually attached to the master bedroom. It's also high in Candida. So there's a real good case that somebody in those two environments is, uh, has a Candida infection. As far as water damage though, this doesn't look too bad in the master bedroom or the master bathroom. So continuing on, so we can kind of get a, a, a full picture of the home. Now we have a baby a baby's room. Here we have one, two, three, four, four different uh, genera of mold and we have bacteria. What's interesting about this is that our mold plates are specific for growth of mold, not so much bacteria, but we don't put anything in there to inhibit the bacteria. So if we get high levels of bacteria, it'll break through and grow. And it's interesting because it gives you an idea of kind of the toxic biologic soup that you're breathing. So here we have a little bit of alternary, a little bit of aspergillus, a lot of bacteria, uh, some candida and some cladosporum. What do we typically see with this? Probably a diaper genie that's in there, clothes that are being stored in there. There's just, it's just not really clean. So this is actually oh. a maintenance issue, not a water damage issue. You see what I'm saying? So it's useful information to say, hey, biologically it's, it's amplified but it's usually pretty easy, easily handled with some cleaning or maintenance uh, done to that. Next to it, we have another kid's bedroom. Here we got two bacteria, two candida, one cladosporum. Does not indicate water damage. Does kind of indicate that maybe the kid needs to take a few more baths or um, wash clothes a little more often because you've got both bacteria and candida, which are most likely coming from the, the child. Then we get to the kitchen. Kitchen now, next to the living room, has five alternaria three aspergillus, five candida, two cladosporum, one penicillium. So now you can see the total count is 16. So it is indicating that there is some type of water damage there, something that's creating amplified mold growth. And then most likely this source of the kitchen was contaminating that living room where we saw the high alternaria. So you're seeing the higher concentrations closer to the, the water source, but that it does spread throughout the house uh, if given enough time. So then on the back side of the kitchen, usually a lot of times there's a laundry room, maybe share a con common wall. Here in this laundry room, we have a lot. Aspergillus, bacteria, candida, cladosporum, fusarium, mucor, penicillium, rhodotorula. And, you know, many of these species aren't, uh, aren't looked at on ERMI, so they wouldn't even pick these up. So here we're saying, okay, well, we have, we have kind of a big toxic biologic soup. Why? Well, one may be the laundry room's not ventilated well enough. So humidity is getting high. Of course, you have dirty clothes in there. Uh, maybe the washing machine isn't cleaned often enough. Maybe the dryer vent needs to be cleaned. And you're getting amplified biologic growth in there. And some of these are bad actors. You know, Fusarium produces some pretty nasty mycotoxins. Of course, Rhodotorula is another yeast, probably related to people or pets. So you're getting kind of a better idea of the biologic condition of the home. And you're seeing the variability in the home and why it's important to test multiple spaces because you don't want to miss uh, this problem and you wanna be able to identify the source. So then we talked about the swab samples as the other form of testing we do. So here's a under the kitchen sink swab. And on that swab, 90% of it had mold covering the swab. Most of it was fungal spores, 85% versus the mycelial fragments, which are like the roots that it grows on. And on this, we see alternaria aspergillus penicillium catomium stachybotrys. That tells us one, that it's a long-term leak, two, that there are some toxic moles there that have to be addressed. Three is we see that this is probably the source of the alternaria. So we saw the alternaria in the kitchen and in the living room. Now we have a swab that shows that these, mm. uh, this cabinetry is contaminated with, with alternaria. So we're getting a real good idea of the total picture of what's going on in the house. So this swab test, we can't do with your plate test. That's like something. The swab test is essentially, it's like a fancy Q-tip, right? It's a hydro flock. It's made almost like a micro microfiber cloth that when you, when you rub the mold and it really just sucks the mold into the swab. And then we look at it microscopically. You certainly could take just a Q-tip, rub it on mold and then transfer it to a mold plate. That's been done for a century. Um, it's a perfectly fine way to see if there's uh, viable mold growing there. It's just, this is a little bit of an easier way to identify the mold if it's there or if it's not truly mold. 
Can we, they get a swab from you or no? Mm -hmm. Oh, yep, we sell really? it. So, yeah, it's again, it's a thirty-five dollars for a swab, and that includes the analysis and consultation. So, okay, if you're looking cool. at dust, you're you'd be considering you're comparing a thirty-five dollars swab to essentially a three hundred dollars ERMI test. That's kind of the comparison there. Okay, yeah, that's really helpful, and that was interesting about because people do ask, like, well, what about like my washing machine? door like is that a problem and so it's interesting some of the maintenance things you kind of mentioned um what was the other thing that was kind of interesting well so you because you know more than the rest of us can kind of tell by the species what um what the source might have been and then when you said this is a long-term thing i'm gonna say a couple things i've learned because i think that uh, stachybotrys is, is a later generation right of the cycling of mold yes yeah, there's a couple of things there. Usually, you know, I kind of described it as a growth sequence, which isn't exactly right, but it's conceptually right. That usually if you get a water leak, aspergillus penicillium will start growing first, maybe cladosporum. Over time, you might just see some, some alternaria, eventually some catomium showing up. And then stachybotrys is, is the last one. And when stachybotrys comes in, it's it's so toxic that it just basically wipes out the other molds that are present. Okay. So that's part of the way to conceptualize it. The other is that molds just grow at better levels of water. So aspergillus penicillium can grow with less water in the building materials, whereas stachybotrys needs more water in the building materials. So it depends on what type of leak you have and how long it's been there and how saturated the materials are. Okay, so I, I don't know if I was blanking out last time we talked about it. I didn't know you had swabs, and that's huge. So now we, you guys use a couple ways to test. So if you are, you know, again, I'm getting these questions now constantly. Well, what about this little spot in my laundry room? This Okay, now you can test basically all of it. You can set some under the kitchen sink. You can swab something that's suspicious. Um, and it's a great way to save money, and you get this consultation and get a sense like is this you know is this serious if i know jw offers sort of like a guide and a map to where to put all the tests you can even then kind of tell like where is it coming from and it's great information to help you decide what to do next and i would say save some money and get some more accuracy in this like inspection and testing process from what i'm hearing you got it. You got it. And so, you know, if if you or your your viewers were to look at this report, of course, they wouldn't have been able to come up with all those different um, thoughts that I had. And that's the value of the consultation. And if we look at the actually the very last page of our report, we have a consultation worksheet. What this is intended to do is prior to your consultation, you fill this out to just jog your memory and make you think of potential questions to ask the consultant, as well as, you know, hey, this area, it didn't test high but it doesn't smell right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. we see that a lot, like in Albuquerque, a lot of the homes are built with sauna tube ducting. Are you familiar with that? Mm -mm. Okay. So it's cardboard HVAC ducting that they put underground. And they did that in the sixties, seventies, eighties. And of course, mold loves cardboard. It's like candy for mold. So as soon as that cardboard gets wet, it starts to break down, it starts to degrade, and your HVAC system is blowing those molds everywhere in your house. So, you know, over time, the spore count may not be that high from there. We can still pick it up, but sometimes it's not that high, but that musty odor is still there. Well, our consultants then are going to go, well, you have a musty odor. Do you have this? Do you have that? You know, do you have a crawl space? Crawl spaces are always a problem. Do you have a swamp cooler? Do you have um, subgrade ducting? Uh, is it sauna tube? So just having that little bit of information can lead us down a path in which we can give some guidance to improve that error. So okay, awesome. So I think you had a picture on another page of what yep. the plate looks like. Can you show that? Sure. And so what we do with the pictures here, there's two. So they always go in order, top to bottom, left to right. So that's the first, second, third, fourth, and then the second page, fifth, sixth, seventh sample. Okay. This does two things for us. One is if you were to test and send them into the laboratory and get this report and you're going to make some changes and you want to see if those changes are improving your health, you can then buy the $3 plate, set it out, compare it to your previous pictures to get an idea if you've made an improvement. So what we're trying to do is provide a lifelong solution for you because, you know, people always say, well, what's your mold story? When they say it to me, I go, which one? I've, I have a dozen mold stories in my own life because I've been aware of this so long. And so mm, yeah. you're going to have water. You're going to have your son that takes a shower and, and doesn't do it properly or 
or my kids that don't turn the fan on. And you want to monitor these things. But we're trying to say, okay, here's your pictures. One is that's going to increase compliance because you're like, wow, that's what I'm breathing. Two is you're going to have something to compare it to. So you say, yeah, I've improved my environment or I haven't in a cost effective way. So that's the intention of the photos. Mm, okay. Well, so these, some of these look pretty nasty. The next page didn't look as bad. Can you kind of tell us what we're seeing? Well, so yeah, and actually Maybe that's, that's a really good question. <laughs> well, well, because so the size of the mold uh, colony doesn't necessarily indicate how bad it is. It's oh. the number of little circles, right? So something like Stachybotrys grows very, very slow if it'll grow at all on one of these plates. Whereas like Rhizopus in 48 hours will cover an entire plate. So here, like uh, on this, the top right picture in, and actually all of them, the, the green colonies, you know, that's all a penicillium. So there's penicillium on there. You can see those very clearly. The little white milky dots would be the, the candida. So, you know, and this picture doesn't exactly correspond to the results. This is an example report. So I just kind of. Oh, you just kind of. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Forgive me for that. It's just a. It was the easy way to do it. So you can see that there are different types of mold. The number of moles, the different colors, all that may indicate kind of, you know, the toxic soup that you're breathing. So it's it's us it's useful, visible information. Okay. So for the people on, there is, if you are on Facebook and you want to make a comment or a question, there is a, a little permission you have to give. Um, it should pop up. It should just be right on there. And it says, it's like, Streamyard forward slash Facebook. You just have to push a button and get permission to let, you know, to let Streamyard like pull your comments. So it's just a protection thing. But you're welcome to do that. Um, Walt was um, saying he had black mold poisoning from Stachybotrys in 2008 that almost killed him. His landlord wouldn't let him test. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we hear these. <laughs> You hear sure. these stories. Well, well, no, that brings up a really good point. Okay. So let's say in that situation, he wanted to break a lease and he was like, okay, I'm going to use your test plates or swabs to break my lease. That's not always the best idea because they're, they, the landlord could potentially say, well, you bias the samples, you contaminated the plates. In that case, you want to hire an inspector who's a third party objective person to come in and collect the samples so that that claim can't be made especially oh if it's i court. see yeah so you have to consider is this potential litigation is it like a real estate transaction are you trying to break a lease or are you just worried about your health because all of those will kind of determine uh whether you hire an inspector versus doing it yourself yeah the whole like legal thing is a whole other i, I can pull up for a resource for you guys, there's a kind of a renter's guide that a friend of ours published. But, you know, I'd say take it with like a grain of salt too, because, you know, d do your own research, speak to an attorney. Uh, I think some of his uh, advice kind of pretty sound, like put it in, put things in writing, right? You don't want to just have verbal conversations with your landlord, but some of it, you know, could maybe vary state to state or, um, you know, can you legally bring an uh, independent inspector in to a place you don't own? I mean, right. Maybe to put down a plate, but they can't be. I don't think they're allowed. You know, I, I from what I understand, that's not. What do you think, J, uh, JW? Uh, we we always sample first and ask for permission later. That's uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, you know, if they're going to try and block you, well, it's better to have the data and, the, and then let them block you. Yeah. It, it's a little messy, so I'll just put mm -hmm. this one resource I know about, and I'm interviewing an attorney here soon, um, so I'll share. Or book, that's going to be in May. We're getting that booked. So, um, yeah, it's, it's some exciting things as this kind of community grows because there's so many areas. We're also interviewing a, a, a realtor who specializes in sort of avoiding mold for people who've been through mold. So I didn't even know that existed. Um, yeah, so that's really exciting. I put that this link in here. This It's called the Renters Playbook, so it can have some ideas uh, for renters. So, JW, I tried to find that coupon code, but they, I think they've taken it down from the site. Um, so if you guys find it later and want to share it, or if you have any other if you wanted to share your site or any other offers you have, I'm happy to put them up here. Sure. Well, let's just do this. We're going to create right now a coupon code of Bridget, 
B-R-I-D-G-I-T. That'll give 10% off and a free poster. And if you give Yay. me, you know, 15 <laughs> minutes, we'll, we'll get that up for you after this concludes. So okay. give me a little bit of time. I'll get it up. We'll make it available for the next, you know, 45 days or something. And uh, if, if that's helpful, okay. great. Perfect. And I put the, um, his link, it's immunolytics.com. Uh, I also can't apparently comment to the Facebook group. So I have to figure that out. Um, but it's going to the YouTube. Uh, and then I wonder if I can put like a banner or something where I can show your link. Um, cool. And while you're doing that, I mean, our, our website, immunolytics.com, I, M as in Mary, M as in Mary, U, N as in Nancy, O, L as in Larry, Y, T as in Tom. There, you got it. Yes, yes, <laughs> You, you can't click on there, but yeah, at least you can see it. Immunolytics.com. It is a bit of like a long name, but um, yeah, and he'll make the site just with my, or the coupon code with my first name. I'll put it here in YouTube, um, but you got my first name here on my page. Uh, here, I'll stop the screen share too. Okay. Um, so put Bridget as a coupon code for 10% off. And the poster is awesome. And it's a lot of education. So if you're going through it yourself, he's like talking about species and like a map. I'm redecorating my office. So actually it matches really nicely <laughs> with my oh. office <laughs> colors. Um, yeah, I just think it's it's a cool, cool resource to have. And like you could buy, you know, a whole bunch of these and then just have them if you know, there's an incident that happens because they're always going to be, like you said, once you're aware, how many incidents over a lifetime <laughs> we have? Mm -hmm. Plenty of them, sure. sadly. So uh, any other thoughts, JW, before we wrap up? Oh, I don't know, Bridget. I got lots of thoughts on everything, but I think we've, we've given enough information. I don't want to overwhelm anyone. So I actually yeah. think it was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let me give you one yeah. last thought. Okay. People will often say that mold plates don't work. What they're saying is that people who go to Home Depot, buy two plates, set them out and get some information, it's not useful information. And I can't disagree because one, they probably didn't sample properly. They didn't collect enough samples. And most importantly, they didn't have the expert consultation to kind of guide them with what the data means and what to do next. So remember that mold plates are tools just like ERMI, just like spore traps, and they require some special interpretation to truly make them effective. Yeah, and your service is like very affordable for the consultation. If you were a different type of person, you would be charging, you know, $700 to do that. And you're charging like under $100 to to talk about your results. I mean, what you walked us through was very valuable to get like a sense of the home. And even like you mentioned, the diaper genie. Oh, it's so interesting because it does create that humidity <laughs> bacteria. Mm -hmm. And like, people do have those specific questions. What about this or that? I get a lot of questions about my pets. Um, and you kind of shared some things pets would bring in. So it's a great way to get a lot of your specific questions answered and mm -hmm. make and I would imagine too, JW, if you're on a consultation and they're like, oh, well, we didn't think to put any plates here or there or whatever, they could do a second round sure. and get more mm -hmm. info. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing we do too is if people mess it up, we, we you pay us to, to for the shipping handling, we'll send you replacement plates because we want people to get good data, you know, do it right yeah. and not feel like they wasted money. So we're just here to help. Awesome. Yeah, you know, it's such an expensive endeavor, but there are ways to save some money here and there. And um, this is a great way while still getting great information. Um, I'm glad I learned a little bit more about it. So I can suggest it to people in different scenarios or even like somebody your spouse is like doubting what you're learning right i think that's cool mm -hmm. here's this plate full of mold and someone telling right. you what so you know it, I, I think that that visually seeing that is very convincing so yep. fantastic well thank you so much for coming on thank you for your patience everyone i so apologize i like was back to back today and i didn't Really, I thought all oh, this technology is easy <laughs> enough, <laughs> and I just screwed it all up. But now I know. Now it's working pretty great, right? It's, yeah, it works great. Yeah, I like it now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we'll be back. I can't remember what our next um, event is as part of the book club, but I will be um, back in touch really soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, JW. All right. Thanks, Bridget. See you. Bye, everybody.